Okay, last but not at all least, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Vladimir Bulovich. He's the founding director of MIT Nano, which is MIT's new 200,000 square foot nanofabrication, characterization, and prototyping facility that is set to open later this year. Uh, Vladimir is a colleague of mine in electrical engineering and computer science. He's a professor of electri electrical engineering at MIT. He holds the Fairbors Mazie Chair in Emerging Technology. He was the first Associate Dean of Innovation of the School of Engineering and the inaugural co-director of MIT's Innovation Initiative. For his passion in teaching, Bulovich has been recognized with the McVicker Fellowship, MIT's highest teaching honor. The title of his talk is Nanoscale Discoveries for Transformative Breakthroughs. Welcome, Vlad. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, indeed, it's extremely exciting to participate in a coke activity. As an electrical engineer, I often find myself mesmerized by the opportunities in developing new kinds of medical advances. And if you can connect them to nanotech scale, indeed, our opportunities are vast. Um, so as a very latest scholar of nanomedicine, that's to say someone who kind of observes and admires, I have looked through the opportunities in a way of connecting this new nano facility we're building, or actually we're about to open here at MIT, um, with what are the opportunities in medicine. Indeed, we found many. Um, so let me just give you a few glimpses into what's coming and the way at least we, from my perspective, perceive the opportunities in connecting nanoscale and uh, indeed what we might see as medical advances of the future. I often put forward a picture like this because it's easy to look at, it's colorful. <laughs> uh, this is gold and silver, except it doesn't really look like typical gold and silver because these are gold and silver nanoparticles and depending on the size, their nano size, you can fine tune their reflection absorption spectrum. Indeed, anything yellow and orange and red on that, on that picture, that is gold. And anything bluish and green, that is silver. And you have seen this. Uh, you have seen it actually many, many times over if you've ever looked at stained glass windows because nanotechnologists of the Middle Ages have used this technique to color the windows. That's to say melt gold and silver in a pot of molten glass and add just the right amount of horse's hair and cow's milk, just like grandma told you, and you're going to get yourself the nanoparticles. And the color only depends on the size, and the size is nanoscale which means if I can find another nanoscale object and make it connect to these nanoparticles, I can maybe change the color of the nanoparticle and hence recognize that the nanoscale object attached itself to the particle. Well, what would this look like? Well, in Lee Gerke's lab, uh, indeed, they realized that viruses are nanoscale and you can attach them to the nanoparticles if you have the right kind of ligands dressing your nanoparticle. Result is that you can take those nanoparticles, spread them on a piece of paper. If you put a drop of blood on a piece of paper and whatever is in the blood reaches the nanoparticles and a binding event happens, you might be able to distinguish between Ebola, West Nile, Zika, and as a result generate an extremely rapid uh, test that consists of a piece of paper and few little chunks of metal and could be transformational from the perspective of delivering medicine in remote areas without having to draw blood, refrigerate it, walk it for a day to a neighboring center that can analyze it and walk back the results. You could in 20 minutes, using this pieces of paper, indeed come up with transformational way to deliver medicine. That's because anything that we typically interact with that is called medicine happens to be nanoscale in size because drugs and vitamins indeed are nanoscale. Now, just as a way of showing this, right, I show benzene here as a yardstick against which we can compare the chemical formulas of aspirin or ibuprofen or vitamins A, B, C, D, some other drugs that you might find in there. And notice that every one of these objects happens to be, roughly speaking, one nanometer in size. For us to truly understand how does our body interact with it, we better truly understand what happens on the nanoscale. Well, that being said, and there were some fantastic talks that I just was observing from the wings there and showing the dimensions on the scale of nanometer. Um, indeed, the opportunity is to go ahead and ask, well, how big is DNA? Well, DNA is about two nanometer in width, but it took us a while to recognize that, right? Back in the late 19th century, we started the search for what is inside our cells. 84 years later, using the best tools we had at the time, we developed the diffraction image, you see in the middle or on the left, 
and the diffraction image informed us that there is something really weird inside our cells that must be possibly a twisted molecule. Now, that's 84 years by hundreds of people trying to figure out what's inside with the best tools available at the time. Well, the best tools of today, indeed, I'll show you one before the best one. This is the one before the best one. This is the best tool of early 2000s, a scanning tunneling microscope that could indeed, in a matter of a couple of hours of hard work, show you what appears to be a twisted molecule that happens to be from inside our cells. So 84 years of work by hundreds of people reduced to a couple of hours of work by a grad student because we happen to finally have the tool sets to see how nanoscale looks. And indeed, if you ask Phil Sharp, uh, he said at one point, you know, pictures not worth a thousand words. Pictures worth a million words when it comes to structural biology because it informs tremendously the opportunity of what to do once you actually look at that nanoscale object that defines us. Of course, Kathy Drennan uh, recognizes this as well. And for example, her latest work at looking at the structure of proteins, or pardon me, enzymes, that are responsible for generation of the blocks that eventually make DNA and comparing what happens in bacteria versus humans has been enabled only through the recent developments of the new cryo-TM technology. Uh, Cryo-EM of the times past was happy to see one to two nanometer resolution, which gave you kind of the rough shape of your molecules. But now you can see 0.3 nanometers, three angstrom resolution, and as a result, be able to see little bits inside those bonds. Indeed, three angstroms is a typical distance of a typical longish bond that you might find between atoms. Well, that's remarkable. We have very deep insights into how nanoscale looks. And indeed, besides the drugs, anything else we interact with, let's, let's say scents. Scents are also nanoscale. So here are molecules that are responsible for our nose detecting the scents of vanilla or lemon or orange. Indeed, nanoscale happens to be what we interact with. Now, the reason why this is so is because these small molecules are small enough that they have less of a vulnerable bond to keep them on the surface and consequently will generate sufficient concentration in the air as they volatilize from the surface up. The smaller they are, the more volatile they are, the more, the more likely they're gonna reach your nose, which implies that inside your nose, you happen to have millions of nanoscale detectors that are able to distinguish between vanilla and rotten fish or strawberry or any other smell that you happen to be sensing. As a matter of fact, if you look at the lemon and orange molecules in the upper left, they're the same picture. I just kind of twisted one by 180 degrees from the other. And the reason why that is so is that I couldn't figure out how on a flat sheet of paper to demonstrate chirality. So it's the same molecule, I'm told, just with a different chirality, twisted one way or the other. If you can distinguish between a lemon and an orange scent, you are sensing nanoscale properties that are down on the scale of a fraction of an angstrom. <laughs> That's remarkable. That is the natural dimension for us to understand the way our bodies work. And if you happen to be in Tim Svager's lab in chemistry, you would recognize that his pursuit is in understanding how to smell things, how to detect the presence of odorants, analytes in the air. So he focused on ethylene more, most recently because ethylene is a plant hormone. It's emitted by every plant when the fruit happens to be ripening. If you want to have a full greenhouse full of ripe tomatoes, you do not wait for one tomato to ripen and then wait for the next one and then wait for the next one because that will take a too long of a time figuring out which ones to pick from the wine, which ones not. Rather, you flood the greenhouse with ethylene and come back tomorrow <laughs> and most of your fruit will be ripe. Same with your bananas, right? You take your green bananas and you stick them in a paper bag because it's still emitting some ethylene and telling your banana to go and turn yellow. So nanoscale triggers are all around us and indeed identify the opportunity for us to how to control the environment around us. And besides humans, bees have realized this as well. Bees communicate by emitting nanoscale molecules, right? Uh, they actually go ahead and tell each other where the honey is by having a particular nanoscale object that they emit in the air. That's remarkable, right? We do as well, right? Our, our own um, em emission of nanoscale molecules can inform others of our presence. Um, or indeed, nanoscale objects like explosives. Those are also important to smell. Uh, so 
Tim Swagger's lab also works on detection of TNT. It happens to be 0.3 nanometers in size. It's strongly electronegative and hence very sticky on any surface it arrives. And if it does stick to an active surface, you can quench the luminescence of that surface as you generate a mid-gap state that causes efficient fret and consequently efficient quenching of your luminescent exciton. That being said, uh, this particular detection technology, which is fluorescent quenching due to the presence of TNT, happens to be as sensitive as dog's nose in identifying presence of explosives. And because of it, this technology has been used in Iraq and Afghanistan by both Army and Marines as a way of saving life and saving limb. So nanoscale detection can advance you in many different ways. Nanoscale detection using molecules that are able to, well, aromatic or aliphatic organic molecules that can indeed directly affect the way we, our biology works, directly affect the way our senses work. Those very same molecules can also transform the way we think about energy harvesting. And so this piece of, uh, this uh, picture here shows you a piece of paper that has been painted, you can think of it, with a thin film of one molecule and another molecule, telocyanine-based molecule and a, a perylene-based molecule. They make a heterojunction that, when illuminated by light, would absorb light very strongly and generate charge. That charge can be collected through the external electrodes, and you got yourself a solar cell. Painted on a piece of paper, using dyes, molecular dyes, aromatic molecular dyes, one nanometer in size each, that happen to also be used as pigments in car paints, reds and blues, painted with nanoscale objects. Now, if you go ahead and ask how thick of a device can, does this need to be, I'll tell you it needs to be about half a micron thick, about one two hundredth the thickness of your hair, and you can coat it on any light surface you choose to, like in this case, we coated it on a one micron thick piece of plastic and then gone ahead and rested our solar cell on top of a soap bubble just to demonstrate a transformational way of thinking of what a solar cell can be. Nearly weightless, if that's how we like it. You also can use those very same nanoscale molecules, organic nanoscale molecules, and say, well, maybe I do not like the color of my solar cell because I have a particular fashion statement I would like to make. In which case, I will tell you, well, how about this? We'll choose organic molecules that do not absorb in the visible light because you can nanoscale engineer the absorption spectrum to absorb only in UV and in the infrared part of a spectrum, consequently giving you a solar cell that is invisible, pretty much. Yet, uh, performs at about two-thirds of what a silicon cell can do in the ultimate limit of what's known as the Shockley Quasar limit of engineering these devices. And here would be a video of one of those cells in room light Let's connect it to a couple of electrodes to go ahead and uh, see if any power can be generated out of it. Indeed, uh, you can absorb the infrared light and generate enough electricity to run a little motor. How much power? Again, this can be as much as 21%. At this point, that's not where technology is, but it could be as much as 21% power conversion efficient. Opportunity is vast if we can control and understand the nanoscale. In biology, again, structural biology tremendously benefits from our final ab ability to observe the details of how things look down at the nanoscale. And indeed, that is the goal of this new facility, what we call MIT Nano, that uh, intends to br bring, bring forward three ingredients to boost innovation. One, bring together people of different disciplines. Well, how do we do that? Well, just make sure you put the building easily reachable right in the middle of campus. Ensure that there, ha doesn't, there happens to be no faculty office inside this building because our office is right next to it. Ensure that no students have an office because they're also right next to it, so they can easily walk to it. Oh, and by the way, make sure all the tools are shared inside the space. 100,000 square feet of lab space, all shared space to enable us to share the innovations. Hence, bring together people of different disciplines who can easily encounter each other around the water cooler, which is... MIT Nano, and who can engage each other because they happen to be waiting for the same tool and one biologist and one electrical engineer find themselves in a conversation that can allow them to break the bounds of both disciplines in order to be able to deliver the next set of opportunities. The building itself, uh, heart of it, consists of clean spaces. Our clean rooms are so-called class 100 and class 1000. 
which means there are very, very few particles that you'll encounter if you happen to be in the middle parts of the building. The, building the clean room stretches over two, clean or two uh, levels. Every level is two floors in height. The, spa the space inside the clean room, besides being very particle clean, also is controlled to within one degree Fahrenheit. It happens to be controlled within 1% in humidity any time of the year, always the same. Hence, allowing you to have reproducible measurements as you keep on going from day to day to day. Now, in the basement is where metrology facilities are. And the very first two tools that are arriving in about two weeks from today are the cryo-electromicroscopes, two of them, that will be embedded inside the quietest place that we have on MIT campus and likely in the um, near Cambridge, Boston area. We have built MIT Nano to have the exquisitely quiet spaces, both mechanically by indeed utilizing five million pound inertial slab and going and isolating the building or at least the imaging spaces from the rest of the noise sources. Every room that accommodates instruments is electrically shielded by aluminum shielding all around. Air comes in laminally rather than blown in. The temperature again is controlled. Humidity again is controlled, for example, down to 30% for these cryo EM rooms. Rooms themselves are $5 million rooms that need to accommodate $5 million tools because of the opportunity. And these tools will be broadly available to the MIT community for utilization. Indeed, I would have to applaud my colleagues in biology, Thomas Schwartz uh, that in particular, who led the effort in bringing the tools on campus for the rest of us to be able to enjoy. And then on the very top of MIT Nano is what we call a prototyping facility and synthesis facilities, chemistry teaching labs, places where students can go and assemble, build from chemicals, nanoscale objects, and about 7,000 square feet of space that allows us to take all those nanoscale discoveries and transform them from pictures that look really pretty under a microscope to handheld objects that could be given to the world and hence allow us to launch technical ideas beyond just hypothetical dem uh, demonstrations into practical handheld technologies. The goal, indeed, is to engage as much of a campus as we can. We project about 2,000 users very soon. Now, how big is that? That's about a quarter of all the grad students and postdocs of MIT. Now, how come we think we can engage people to do things like art? This is, by the way, a grain of sand <laughs> written by an electron microscope. There is a sand castle sitting on top of it. This was done at MIT a couple of years ago at, using eBeam over at the Media Lab. But the reason why we're so confident that as many as 2,000 users will step into MIT Nano is because of our present user base. Our present user base is about 2,000 users between our present micro nanofab and our present imaging facilities. Remarkable number that I stumbled upon as I was thinking about how to make MIT Nano as useful as I can is I asked, well, how many young faculty today would need nanoscale tools of MIT Nano to advance their work? In the School of Science, 51% of recently tenured professors use nanoscale to advance their work. About 34% do it through physical demonstrations and about 17% through the digital numerical analysis of the nanoscale phenomena. In a school of engineering, 67% of the recently tenured professors, and by recently I mean over the last dozen years, use nanoscale to advance every discipline in the school of engineering, and there are 10 different departments in the school of engineering. The recently tenured professors are the ones that will be around for the next 30 to 40 years, right? Hence, whatever they happen to be doing will be indeed the definition of what is to come. Much of our future discoveries coming from MIT, given the profile of who we right now have, will be enabled through the nanoscale discovery. Well, and hence, where will we come up with transformational advances using nanoscale? Well, clearly medicine and life sciences, energy systems, computing and information, manufacturing, materials and structures, quantum science and technology, but most importantly, education, right? Because as an institution, our primary products are knowledge and people, and our primary metric is impact delivered by our knowledge and by the great people we graduate as they step out of MIT and transform the world. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Vlad. We can't wait to use all those fun toys. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there. I hope you've enjoyed the day as much as I have. Um, and you're now persuaded about how far we've come in nano and how much there is to do in nanomedicine in the future. Um, I want to just uh, wrap up by thank, doing a few thank yous. So I really want to thank um, Paula and Angie, our co-chairs. Um, it was really fun to, to work with you on this and always. Um, speakers from within MIT and outside of MIT, the panelists, um, we really appreciate all of your contributions, our sponsors for their support and financial contributions. Um, and then the many, many people behind the scenes who really made today happen. There is a lot of work um, that goes into making things run so smoothly. Um, Pam Daffria, Cindy Quince, Anna Taconic, um, and Tarek Fidel, so much of today was um, your brainchild. Um, all the administrators at the KI and MIT, and thank you all for um, your attention and your participation. So um, a round of applause for everyone, and have a great weekend.